Hi everybody, Shannon and Karen with Wandering Out Yonder. Today we are in Pine Grove Furnace State Park with another uh, series in our, another segment for our series, the Appalachian Trail Museum and the community that surrounds it. Today we're going to introduce you guys to a really pretty cool gentleman. His name is Larry Luxembourg. Now Larry is the president, the visionary, and the founder of the Appalachian Trail Museum. Now, maybe you guys didn't know, the Appalachian Trail Museum is the only museum in the country currently dedicated to hiking. In 1994, Larry released his book. It's called Walking the Appalachian Trail. Really good book. It's a compilation of stories of about 200 hikers through hikers people who are deeply connected to the Appalachian Trail. And during the research for his book, the seed was planted for the Appalachian Trail Museum. He realized there was a need for saving and preserving the artifacts and telling the history and, and the story of the past, present, and future of the Appalachian Trail. So shortly after Larry published his book, he began his legacy and vision of what is now the AT Museum. My name is Larry Luxembourg. Um, I, I through hiked the Appalachian Trail in 1980. I didn't have uh, a trail name back then, so uh, people now sometimes call me Pack Rat. You know, I collected things, and that's how I started the Appalachian Trail Museum. So as promised, today we are going to be talking with Larry Luxembourg. Larry, thanks for coming out today on this beautiful Memorial Day weekend. We appreciate it very much. Well, nice to be here. Nice to be chatting about the AT. All right. Now, so as we have said before in previous videos, the Appalachian Trail Museum is set up in three sections, the past, the present, and the future. So we're going to kind of touch on that today with you, if you don't mind. Sure. Try to hit all three things. Okay. Um, one of the things I want to say to you that there are so many people who have dedicated their lives who've had vision or I call visionary people um, Myron Avery everybody who's been involved with the Appalachian Trail and I we want you to know Shannon I want you to know that we also consider you to be a visionary your vision of the Appalachian Trail Museum is why that it's here today right well thanks right. all right one of the things that we are very curious about is how it began. So sure, so so it's it's quick to tell, but it took a long time. So I threw hiked the AT in, in 1980, and I had a, I was a, a newspaper reporter at the time, and I had it in mind, to, just kind of in the back of my mind, to do a book on the AT, and I didn't get around to doing that till 1993, and I started doing research. On, on the Appalachian Trail and I was in the the archives at, at ATC headquarters in Harpers Ferry and it occurred to me that nobody was preserving the artifacts of, of the AT's past and it, there should be a separate group that would be dedicated to that. The ATC has a lot of missions but their primary mission is protecting the trail and making sure the trail is there and it could never be their primary focus to preserve the history of the trail. And then um, in 1998 it was the 50th anniversary of the first through hike and we were getting together uh, as many of the pioneer through hikers as, as we could and that was a golden opportunity to, to seek out those early hikers and see if we could um, preserve their equipment and their memorabilia and so forth. So so at that time, I, I proposed the idea of an Appalachian Trail Museum. And normally when you propose an idea, you expect people to poo-poo the idea and tell you all the reasons not to do it. But instead, the reverse happened. And everybody I've, I've mentioned that idea said, that's a great idea and here's what you should do. Mm -hmm. And they would give me a list of assignments and we started working on those assignments and and gradually uh, the the museum took shape so 
So we first talked about it in 1998, and we opened up here on National Trails Day, June 5th, 2010. And along the way, we acquired a, a really talented group of volunteers with, with all sorts of different skills. Uh, and, and as you touched on before with Myron Avery and Ben McKay and so many others, it's just amazing how many people have so dedicated so much effort and and have have done so much for the Appalachian Trail. It's it's really incredible. And I've asked a lot of people why they think that is, and nobody's given me a satisfactory answer. But people like to work together on a project. Um, they make good friends that way, and they they want to be involved in a meaningful project that that's bigger than themselves. And the AT itself um, has has always been a volunteer project, and now each year. Uh, about 6,000 people were recorded doing a couple hundred thousand hours of volunteer hours for the trail and and we tapped into that for the museum so so it's been our good fortune to have dozens and dozens of volunteers help out with the exhibits construction paperwork accounting whatever we've needed it's just uh, publicity d design skilled volunteers have just shown up at the right moment and and done great work for us okay so it's kind of back to that the community that we keep going to it that it's not just it's not just the blaze it's the community around it that makes the appalachian trail what it is yeah the, the it's a really unusual community so so the appalachian trail is is basically a volunteer project you know, there's professionals at the National Park Service and the Appalachian Trail Conservancy and some of the clubs. But at its heart, from the, the beginning in 1921, it's been volunteers. And, and it's been a leader nationally in recreation and tapping volunteers. So, so it was the first um, unit where the National Park Service actually dedicated, um, gave management authority to a, a volunteer organization. So in 1984, the National Park Service signed a cooperative agreement with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy delegating management responsibility, including managing uh, the, the lands of the AT, you know, tracking the borders, making sure nobody was doing timber rustling, as, as well as managing the footpath and the hikers on the trail. So it's very unusual for a government agency to delegate that kind of responsibility to a nonprofit. And it, it's really an indication of how powerful and, and dedicated the, the Appalachian Trail community is to the trail. And you also have people in communities along the trail, trail angels who love to help out hikers. They take them into their house for a night they they give them a meal as they're hiking by and it's it's just all part of this this really wonderful appalachian trail community so you have had the fortune of meeting some of the very iconic people who are part of the past history who are those people that you you were able to meet or their family members who could kind of connect you to them yeah i i came along um, when when the the trail was about 60 years old mm -hmm. um, so so I, I I knew all of the the very early through hikers and and some of the people who were involved in building the trail at least kind of in the, the second and, and third tier of mm -hmm. of the trail so so it was a unique time to come along and that was helpful in putting the, the museum together but the first shoot through hiker to do the trail, Earl Schaefer, I, I knew for 20 years. The the second through hiker, Gene Espy, who hiked in 1951, you know, I've I've known for over 40 years. The third through hiker, Chester Jingaluski, uh, I got to know briefly for three or four years, but got to know Chester well. So so it was a unique time to come along, as well as some of the early trail builders, uh, Ruth Blackburn. She and her husband Fred first got involved with the uh, with the Potomac Appalachian Trail um, Club in in the late 1920s, and and Ruth uh, was working on the trail into the 1980s. Uh, so I met Ruth when she was 86 and still a really dedicated trail volunteer. So I've gotten to know um, a lot of the. Um, 
board members and, and uh, people involved with the Appalachian uh, Trail Conservancy and member clubs. So, so it's been a really unique perspective that I've been able to get over the years. And it's, it's been my great fortune to have got to know all these people. Plus, um, one of the most well-known hikers, Grandma Gatewood, um, Grandma Gatewood died in 1973 and I didn't get active till 1980 so I never met Grandma Gatewood but I, I she had 11 kids and I knew mm -hmm. more than half of her kids mm -hmm. and, oh, wow. and and uh, became very good friends with with her youngest uh, uh, daughter so so I've known a lot of the families of Earl Schaefer and Grandma Gatewood and many of the other early through hikers so um, through hiking just became very popular in the 1970s and from the first through hike in 1948 for the first quarter century to 1972 there were under 50 through hikers and I probably got to know about half of those over the years and then in 1973 Ed Garvey's um, book on, on the Appalachian Trail inspired uh, a, a quantum jump in through hikers um, so, so I got to know Ed well over the years and his family and a lot of those early through hikers in, in the, the 1970s. And the year I did the trail, 1980, was the first really big year on the trail. So about 200 through hikers um, did the trail. And actually the, the decadal years, 1980, 1990, 2000, were, were all very big years. And, and now uh, the usage on the trail has, has gone up tremendously but but it, it was my fortune to know a lot of the early through hikers actually um, one one of those few people he, he wasn't a through hiker but he did the, the the trail in four sections from 1966 to, to 1970 mm -hmm. yeah he actually crashed my wedding oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's awesome. so <laughs> so Frida and I got got married on on Bear Mountain the first section of the AT it was dedicated a hundred years ago 1923 we got married on top of Bear Mountain right by an AT play blaze and one of my good friends was, was was staying with one of the early through hikers, so he just brought him along to my wedding. <laughs> oh, that's cool. What a cool story yeah, yeah, yeah. for you to have. Yeah, 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 yeah. What a memory, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. How did you convince these people that to just, you know, start being like, yeah, go ahead and, and take some family heirlooms and take some, some major parts of history? I mean, how, how do you go about doing that? It, it varies how we end up collecting this stuff. So um, it's, it's such a meaningful part of somebody's life that, that a lot of people don't want to part with things. And, and then if they pass, their family members just consider it junk, right? There's a hole in their t-shirt and it's all moldy right. or something like right. that. Mm -hmm. And they can't wait to throw it out. <laughs> They've been dying to throw that out. So, so somewhere in there between somebody's unwilling to part with this precious stuff and somebody else pitches the junk mm -hmm. is where we have to collect. So we've, we've put the word out at various hiker events, the Appalachian Long Distance Hikers Gathering every Columbus Day weekend, trail days uh, in Damascus, Virginia the weekend after Mother's Day. So, so we've always been, uh, since 1998, we've been a presence at all these hiker events. We've, we've had publicity in, in trail publications and things. So, so think people have known of, about the stuff that we, we wanted. And, and some people couldn't wait to get it out of their house. One guy was getting divorced and he was running out of space. <laughs> so he gave us a bunch of stuff, you know. Other people, they, they wanted a good place where their stuff would be preserved and they were happy to do, do that. Other times, you know, it's taken psychology and it can be very difficult. You know, the, the family is bereaved and you don't, you know, well, well the, the body is, is still waiting to be buried. You don't want to go to the family and say, you know, that's really terrible that but what that, are you uh, going to do yeah. with the hiking stuff <laughs> yeah 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 don't throw out the hiking stuff you know <laughs> yeah, I, I want it yeah so i'm so, so sorry but <laughs> so so that can be very difficult and sometimes we lose stuff um sometimes um chester jingalewski who was the the third th through hiker and the first southbound through hiker he he and gene Espy met on the trail in 1951 
and and Chester came from a blue collar factory, a blue collar uh, worker. He he worked in the Naugatuck Valley in Connecticut, and his mother wanted him to buckle down and work and not do this hiking stuff. So she threw out his equipment to discourage him from doing any more hikes. So so that would have been some of our mo most precious artifacts, and. And you know, so those were lost to history. And and Chester had one remaining thing. He had a personal letter from Myron Avery, you know, the person who put the trail on the ground in the 20s and 30s and 40s. And he didn't want to part with that original letter from Myron Avery. He gave me a copy of that. But then a few months later, he he passed, and and that original letter and one or two other things that he still possessed were were lost. So it, it, it's a balancing act. Um, Ed Garvey stuff, um, we, we knew we wanted it. We told the family they wanted us to have it, but, but I'm, I'm a pack rat. They were super pack rats and they couldn't bear to part with the stuff and the family members couldn't agree and, and so forth. And so we waited 15 years for Ed Garvey stuff. Then I got a call over the weekend and they said we're selling the house on Friday we need you to, to, to get the stuff mm -hmm. now if you want it so we got four of our volunteers two vans and and they loaded 60 boxes of stuff and brought it back to to our storage area wow. in, in four days wow. so so collections is is always an interesting part of the process and and over the years we we've amassed a lot of stuff well, Earl Schaefer, the first through hiker, uh, the Smithsonian got interested in Earl Schaefer. Mm -hmm. So so they got the pick of Earl's stuff, and I, I don't dispute that. You know, the Smithsonian has professional curators and so forth, and very high visibility. But anyway, some stuff the Smithsonian didn't want, so we took that. You know, so I had boxes of Earl Schaefer stuff. And, you know, before we had a proper storage area, I would bring stuff to my house. And uh, one time I was lifting a heavy box from my, my bedroom closet, a, a top shelf, and it just seemed unusually health, heavy to me. And I brought the box down and I looked in it, and among other things, there was Earl Schaefer's hatchet that <laughs> <laughs> wow. had been in my bedroom closet <laughs> for years. Cool. And, and I, I'd forgotten about it. But we do have one original item from each of Earl's three through hikes. Um, and and a anyway, a lot of the stuff is at the Smithsonian, and we still have a lot of Earl Schaefer stuff. So, you know, we cooperate with other museums and other institutions, and if somebody wants to borrow stuff from us, we're willing to do that too. Okay. So, so there's a lot behind the collections. Yeah. <laughs> do you actively say, I want so-and-so's this, and then try to ever go after it, or do you more so wait for people to come to you with the stuff? So, so I've always felt that we should be proactive on the collecting. And if I'm interacting with somebody, I always, you know, especially if it was one of the early hikers, somebody from the 60s or 70s, I make sure to let them know that, that their junk is precious to us. Mm -hmm. and, and I tell them, you know, if you're not ready to part with it now, just keep us in mind. But if you're ever tempted to throw it out, you know, don't throw it out. Give it to me. <laughs> there you go. Um, so, so we haven't been as proactive as as I'd like, but but we have rescued some stuff. the The first person to hike the Appalachian Trail, uh, Continental Divide Trail, and Pacific Crest Trail in in one year. It's called the Triple Crown of mm -hmm. of of hiking, and to do all three in in one year is eight thousand miles of backpacking, thirty five miles a, a day. Uh, Brian Robinson averaged when when he did the the triple crown and and at one point um, our founding librarian uh, Linda Patton contacted Brian and said we want your stuff and Brian said you you got me at a good time I was just planning to throw this stuff out wow. so so instead he sent us a box of stuff you know so truly historic by stuff. being proactive you were yeah. able to yeah. get that stuff yeah okay. but, but we haven't been as proactive as we'd like you know there there's a lot of parts to the museum, and and you never get everything right. And um, but yeah, that's something we we've thought about all along, and just not not done as well as we would have liked. Okay. Was there anything on your um, go and get list that you you just missed? And 
Oh, so so one of the things we missed, um, actually, the the person who was helping the Garvey family uh, with their stuff, Dave Sherman, and he's one of the pioneers who worked for the Park Service and the Forest Service, was one of the pioneers in preserving the trail corridor and making sure that the the AT remained a, a continuous and, and great trail. Um, he worked with the Garvey family and, and he knew we were trying to preserve stuff for the trail. But, you know, from, from the time we were involved with, with that till we opened the museum was, was about 10 years. And, and over that time, Dave lost a little faith that we were going to get the museum uh, going and, and he downsized his living quarters and had to get rid of his 2000 book library on the AT oh my and, gosh. and gave away and, and, and sold his, his, his library. So, so that was one of the, the great tragedies of our collection <laughs> efforts. And Dave is now, you know, a, a real part of our museum family. He's been active with, um, helping to select people for the Appalachian Trail Hall of Fame and so forth. And despite that loss, we've built a 3,000 book research library um, for AT, AT books. So we have the biggest collection of AT books, magazines, and, and so forth of any place in the world. We have a lot of books that don't have a Library of Congress number, so they're not in the Library of Congress. So we have way more books on the Appalachian Trail than the Library of Congress. And actually, the Library of Congress has one catalog number for the AT. That doesn't work for us with our 3,000 no, books. No. So, so Linda had to come up with a unique uh, cataloging system to differentiate our 3,000 book library. So, so we even have developed a, a unique catalog system for AT books. Very uh -huh. cool. Very cool. We, we are actually going to be talking with Kurt. Uh, Kurt. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. our, our current next, library. Next week, I yep. think. Next week. Yep. Yeah. Because so. we're real interested in the library as well. We were up there once before and again. Um, we said when we first started doing this series, it was so overwhelming. We said, okay, can we come back? Because <laughs> there's so much, yeah. you know. So, yeah. So, so we accepted Kurt as our second librarian. We, we felt that his experience with the special collection at George Washington's uh, uh, house, Mount Vernon, was sufficient oh. preparation for him to yeah, take wow. over our library. <laughs> I did not know that about yeah. him. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah, cool. yeah, he's a very experienced okay. librarian. That that was not his only post. Okay. So in addition to being a, a through hiker and and fascinated by the AT, he's in a, you know both he and Linda were really skilled librarians. Linda is a retired research librarian from Florida State and and um, has read at least 600 books on yeah, the AT wow. and ha has probably the, the the most detailed knowledge of the AT literature of anybody okay. as, as well as being a really experienced reference library. Okay. All right, cool. So those are the quality of people we've attracted right. yeah, that's fantastic. To, to this humble museum. That's fantastic and all volunteer. Everybody involved with the AT Museum is a volunteer, except we have a part-time manager, and we run a hostel now. The, we opened the hostel just in time for the global pandemic, mm -hmm. so, so our hostel keeper uh, is also a, a part-time paid employee, and occasionally we, we have to pay exhibit fabricators or various other things. but. The, the great preponderance of our work and staffing and everything is, is purely volunteers. And that's one of the things I can tell you for me that is just so overwhelmingly fantastic about this. You know, it's is how many people volunteer their time, how devoted that they all are to the Appalachian Trail, the museum, and how much they give, how much knowledge they share to get everything the way that it needs to be. Yeah. Again, that community. Yeah. It's the it's, community. Yeah. It's and, and such skilled people and such dedicated people. For a while, we had somebody driving two and a half hours to cut our grass. Wow. As a volunteer. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah it's just amazing. It volumes. Am yeah. Amazing people. Yes, yeah, yeah. All right. So now we kind of want to get into the present uh, with the Appalachian Trail Museum. And I guess um, talk to you about what's going on now. We did hear uh, from Julie that you guys have 
a possible shelter build coming up of Earl Schaefer's with the stones. Yes. So, so one of the things we're, we're working on, and we've been working on it since um, we, we opened in, in 2010, there, Earl built uh, half a dozen shelters, and he also relocated. He was the primary person in relocating uh, about 50 miles of the AT on both sides of the Susquehanna River north of Harrisburg. And in the process of that, he built a half a dozen shelters. Most of them were wood and, and burned down. Uh, one that was on Peter Mountain, we, we, we took apart and, and brought to the museum, actually even before we were open in 2008. So that's the centerpiece of, of the museum, and it's been the centerpiece since we opened. But the, the one other shelter that survived that Earl built, he built it around um, 1960 um, on, on North Mountain and, and west of the Susquehanna River. Um, it was at Dean's Gap and on the what, what's become the Darlington Trail. So we, we got together a, a crew to, to take that apart, um, you know, and they had skid loaders and all this, this equipment. Uh, and it was on state game land, so we, we, we had to do the work when there was no hunting season in Pennsylvania, okay, which turned which out is, to be mo between Memorial Day and Labor yeah, Day. Yeah, to say there was a slither of time there, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was so only three months when we could do work. So, so anyway, we, we, we did that in, in 2011, and we've had the pile of stones about 100 yards from the museum ever since. And, you know there have been various obstacles and we got diverted with other things so so now we're focused this august is the 75th anniversary of earl's pioneering 1948 through hike mm -hmm. so we're determined to mark that anniversary we're, we're having a, a a special day the second weekend of august where we're, we're going to have various members of the the schaefer family here the earl schaefer foundation and, and have speakers and, and ceremonies commemorating the 75th anniversary. And as part of that, we're hopeful of dedicating that pile of stones and having a, it as an out, outdoor shelter uh, at the museum. It, it won't be a place where, where people can sleep, but it'll be an exhibit showing, you know, what one of the early trail shelters was, was like. So, so we've gotten permission from the park to, to do that project and, and we're just working on that today and we, we have two two and a half months and hopefully it, <laughs> it, we, we will dedicate something that day and hopefully it'll be a completed <laughs> shelter. Something, something will be dedicated that day. Yeah and okay. we're hoping that that'll be the centerpiece of that that special Schaefer day but one way or another we're going to get that sh shelter done. Okay looking forward to that. Yes. Yeah. The other thing that's new in the museum that we we just recently saw this year when we went in was your the interactive map. We thought uh -huh. that was pretty cool. So so this is our most complicated and and um, expensive and, and detailed exhibit. We we have um, a, an interactive map that that's drawn to to scale. Uh, of the whole Appalachian Trail. So it really gives you perspective on the AT. And we're gradually adding interactive features. So when we opened it, we, we had one monitor and, and it showed this, this area and somebody could click on that. You know, the, the Pine Grove Furnace area of Pennsylvania where the museum is. And we had various pictures and information about this area. And we're gonna add four other monitors um, one for each of the sections of the trail. We're working on two monitors this year. And, you know, as part of this, we, we developed, um, one, one of our volunteers, Steve Parody, has developed a laser system for highlighting the points on the trail. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the things we had to do was anchor this map exactly. Otherwise, the laser wouldn't work. <laughs> the lasers <laughs> would be, would be pointing down <laughs> yeah. at, at the wrong thing. And right. when you have this very detailed map, you know, it's it's like an eighth inch, you know, variation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so exact scale and we have the lasers pointing out the exact areas. Mm -hmm. So we had to be very careful with that. And it's, 
you know, a, a, a new skill we had to learn. But, but anyway, um, our visitors to the museum, from the first time we, we put that out, even before we hooked up the electronics, they've just loved this museum. They crawl all over it. They're fascinated by it. It really helps them visualize the whole AT and, and see the topographical features and the elevation changes and everything. So, so it, it's been a real hit. I know the AT, so I'm not as fascinated, right. <laughs> but, right. but, well, but our visitors love it. I, yeah. I think it's fantastic <laughs> because for me personally, one of the things when I first started hiking with my grandkids was I would talk to them when we would be on the AT. I would say, do you know the AT starts in Georgia and it ends in Maine? Well, my oldest grandson had an understanding of that. He was at the age, he was like, wow. But to come in here and to visually see that whole trail and the, top the topography of the ups and downs with it was really cool. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, so it's amazing. Um, at, at Bear Mountain Bridge, where, where the AT crosses the Hudson, you're only about 60 feet above sea level. And at, at, at the high point in the Great Smokies, um, on Klingman's Dome, you're, you're at 6,600 feet. So, so there's a lot of variation along the trail. Mm -hmm. Some of the other trails, not as much variation. The, the Pacific Crest Trail starts at the Mexican border at 3,000 feet, and you're, you're mostly in the mountains, um, pretty high up on, on the PCT. You get down close to sea level one time, but the AT has much more variation in, in elevation and geographical features than a lot of the other major mm -hmm. trails. Yep. This is their interactive map that you can see where you're at on the trail. It will light up. Yep. And that's where we are now, is right there in relation to the entire trail. All right, so you guys are gonna see a photo of Larry in, in 1980. In 1980, taken at the Harpers Ferry. The Appalachian Trail Conservancy headquarters. And he has a story he's going to share with you about that photo. So, so there's a couple things about that, that story, uh, about that photo. So first of all, I'm wearing blue jeans. And I did start the trail in blue jeans. And, and that's not a good idea because that mm -hmm. cotton, when it gets wet, um, can lead to hypothermia and, and can be fatal. So even I learned after a couple weeks, you should not have blue jeans on the trail. And right. I got rid of the blue jeans. But for the, the first time after I was on the trail, my parents met me in Harper's Ferry. So, um, you know, I'd been gone for a couple of months and done 900 miles. Um, and I was still alive, all of which was a surprise to them. <laughs> and, you know, as a change of clothes while they were visiting with me, they, they brought me blue jeans. So in that picture, I look like not a through hiker because I'm wearing blue jeans. <laughs> uh, but any, anyway, so that was in 1980. And in 1979, Gene Cashin, who was one of the early employees of the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, um, had gotten a Polaroid camera for Christmas and she was thinking what to do with it. So she brought it into her job at, at ATC and, and developed this tradition of, as every through hiker visited Harper's Ferry, she'd take their Polaroid mm -hmm. photo. Mm -hmm. So this was only the second year um, this took place and it continues to, to this day, mm -hmm. 44 years later. Um, and, and one of the early things we did when we were getting the museum going was in cooperation with ATC, we, we started a project of digitizing every one of the 12,000 photos they had. So one of our volunteers got a grant from the Quimby Foundation and we got equipment and one at a time we, we took those Polaroids and, and digitized the, those photos. Uh, Terry Harley Wilson, who spearheaded that project, did the bulk of those photos, and we had some other volunteers who digitized those. And we, we continue to add those photos, and we have a, a website, athikerpictures.org, where you, where you can see all those photos. And we also run those on a loop in, in the museum. But whoever's been involved with that think it's a, thinks it's a good joke to show me when I was young, had a beard and was, was skinny. So th they always feature my, my uh, 
1980 photo, you know, June of 1980 from uh, Harper's Ferry. Larry in his blue jeans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so I guess the next thing that I would want to talk to you about is what y the future of the museum is. So, um, I, I have ideas about the, the future of the museum, but, but most of um, our, our projects or the things we, we end up doing come from suggestions from the people who are involved. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we have a, um, a, a special garden um, between the ramp and the main floor of the museum. And one of our volunteers came to me and she was a little nervous and she asked if it was okay if she could develop a pollinator garden for us. She wanted to do a lot of work. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> she, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, so, my standard response, unless it's like totally crazy, and my definition of totally crazy is very expansive. So, if somebody comes to us with a good idea, I just say, How can, how, how can we help you get that done? Okay. So, anyway, she and her husband and other volunteers, they brought tons of mulch and they worked hard on this garden and they've developed an award winning pollinator garden. Um, one one of our other great volunteers, Jim Foster, whose portfolio spans from from the Hall of Fame to doing <laughs> some uh, contracting uh, construction work for us, uh, as as well as legal, he's a retired lawyer. So he he came to me in in 2010, the fall of 2010, and said, "You should have a Hall of Fame for the AT." And a couple weeks later. He said, you know, have you done anything for this uh, idea of a Hall of Fame? And I said, no, how can we help you? Right. So he developed an Appalachian Trail Hall of Fame. We inducted our first class in 2011. <laughs> We've had a successful banquet every year to bring in the new class, except for during the pandemic. And, you know, again, this year, September 10th, we're going to have an induction ceremony um, for another class uh, of the Hall of Fame, and it's become accepted all through the community uh, as a really important feature. So people like Grandma Gatewood, when you know you're seeing an article about them or an obituary, in the first sentence it says, you know, a member of the first class of the AT Hall of Fame, or wow. the second second class of the AT Hall of Fame, or something like that. So these are all things that the volunteers have have brought to us. So. Your, your, your question about what I see as the future of the museum, you know, I have ideas, I have things I'd like to see, I'd like to be more aggressive on the outreach. Uh, we're, we're close to, to filling up the, the museum, we've added some exhibits to, to the Iron Masters mm -hmm. Hostel, but, but we'll, we'll always need new, new space. I remember uh, when President Reagan dedicated an, a new building uh, for the Library of Congress, he said, "You have the same problem I do. What to do with your old National Geographics?" But, but it was just an idea that that every museum is always collecting as long as it it's vibrant, and you're always going to need more space. So we'll need more space. We'll develop in in ways that are impossible for for me to predict. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of things. You know, there's so many stories to tell about the AT Museum, and there are only so many that we can tell in the the physical facility here without overwhelming people. Mm -hmm. um, so, so how we tell stories, um, video, audio is, is a big component of mm -hmm. what we would like to do in the mm -hmm. future. It's always eluded us. We have a lot of speakers and we've had some fantastic talks here that, that haven't been recorded and that's a shame, but going forward we want to learn from those mistakes. Mm -hmm. So that's an area we, we would like to emphasize. Um, and, and one of my immediate goals for the past 12 years has been to have a new dedicated building to the Hall of Fame. Uh, I don't know where and when that'll happen, but that's one of my goals. Okay. One of the things that Shannon and I have heard kind of through the grapevine listening to some of the volunteers, we were at a volunteer picnic this past week, they were talking about a warehouse that you have, the storage unit, a storage unit. And I was so intrigued. Yeah. <laughs> they were talking about all the stuff that you have. Yeah. So we would like to, I mean, can you share any of that <laughs> cool stuff that's hiding? So three of our volunteers, 
during the pandemic. I mean, it was a good pandemic uh, project because you could do it by yourself <laughs> and not not worry about dying. Uh, so, so it's always been been difficult for us to to keep up with cataloging the the stuff because stuff is always arriving. Uh, so anyway, we have a storage unit in Carlisle, and we actually doubled our space there the, this this past fall. We we have a unit, and the unit next to us became available, so we jumped on it. Um, we we help the Earl Schaefer Foundation. We 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 store stuff for them, but we have all sorts of stuff in storage. We have lots of historic backpacks. We have one from. Uh, Buzz Caverly, who was a legendary and many decadal uh, park managers of Baxter Park. I mean, he personally knew um, Percival Baxter, the former governor of Maine, who donated the land for Baxter State Park, and all he, Buzz knew all the early through hikers and so forth. So, so we have Buzz's pack and some other things like that. We we have a pack from uh, Billy Goat who got started on the AT, um, hiking in Meriden, Connecticut, eventually did did the AT and, and lots of other trails around the world, but he became more noted for the Pacific Crest Trail, but, but we have one of Billy Goat's packs, you know, some other historic fic, feet, um, people, we have some of their, their packs. Um, one of the things we have is a parachute. So, um, Jumpstart parachuted. He was a very experienced uh, jumper. And he parachuted to start his through hike onto Springer Mountain, Georgia, and Springer Mountain is completely forested, and there's no way to parachute on there. But so somehow, somehow he did. Somehow he did it. <laughs> somehow he did. Now, unfortunately, uh, the parachute we have is not the one he he used for that jump. Um, he, he sold that parachute and got another parachute. So the one we have, he did hundreds of jumps and it's, uh, you know, it's it's not the prime artifact we would have wanted to have. But it but, was his. But it was his mm -hmm. and we have a parachute. Mm -hmm. We we have a chainsaw. Uh, Bert Gilbert, a very quiet, unassuming a man who did a lot of trail work in, in New Hampshire and hosted trail volunteers, very sociable host. Uh, Bert, did the AT three consecutive years, 1972, 73, and 74. So the first woman to do the whole trail three times was Grandma Gatewood. Um, Bert was the first man to do the whole trail uh, three times. He didn't realize that till I told him. Oh, <laughs> but, really? but anyway, um, I, you know, I, he, I knew he'd done a lot of trail work and stuff, so I asked him for some tools. So anyway, he gave me a chainsaw that was worn out. So mm -hmm. we haven't we haven't uh, put that on an exhibit yet, but actually um, we're, we're working on a couple of, of exhibits of Pioneer Trail Tools, so hopefully some of that stuff will, will be out of storage and at the museum later this year. And it's, it's a way of highlighting the work of the volunteers and, uh, uh, you know, the, the attention always goes to through hikers and it's inevitable. It's, a fascinating story. It's what the public wants to hear. It's what the trail community wants to hear. Um, it's it's really hard to uh, dramatize, you know, your work. I, I went out today and I was cutting brush and painted some blazes. I mean, it's, right. it doesn't tell a dramatic story, but it is a big part of the AT story. So, so we always make an effort to highlight the, the work of volunteers, and that'll be something uh, um, we, we want to get. So, um, one of the things we want to do with the stuff in storage, we want to tell the history of backpacks over the years. Uh, we have a lot of different equipment. Um, you know, everything from a, a couple of ounce alcohol stove that somebody's carried the whole length of the trail to um, shoes. We have hiking boots that, that Bill Irwin, the first blind hiker, had. Uh, in Nimble Wool Nomad, we have some of his things in storage. You know, he was the oldest man to hike the whole trail. And, um, you know, Billy Goat has hiked over 50,000 miles. They give an award for people who have hiked over 50,000 miles. So we have a lot of equipment and things for people that have backpacked over 50,000 miles. And I can assure you that 50,000 miles of backpacking 
a it, lot of miles. It's a, it's a lot. So a typical mm -hmm. through hiker will do 15 miles a day. So divide that into 50,000. Oh, wow. yep. And 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 that's that's a lot of days on the trail. So not only is there so much history just sitting in that building, you've yeah. got stories not even told yet in storage right now. So so industry statistics, the average museum has on display 2 to 4% of what's in their collection. So something that's in the Smithsonian's collection might be on display once in a hundred years, if ever. So, so the stuff the uh, Smithsonian had of Earl Schaefer, they did a six-month exhibit. Uh, you know, they had Earl's uh, boots from from 1948 and some of his other equipment. They they had this huge room for kind of his journal, his boots. And, and a, a half dozen panels telling the story of Earl's through hike. And it was a really amazing exhibit. The exhibit before had been one of the five original copies of the Gettysburg Address, and then they shifted to right. <laughs> Earl Schaefer's <laughs> boots. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Earl Schaefer's stuff may never be exhibited again by the Smithsonian, right. mm -hmm. and it's, it's just, um, you have to pick and choose, and, and your cur curator has to decide what story we want to tell now. So is that kind of where you're at in this museum, it's where you're going to have to go through that cha change out of your displays to kind of, I guess, get as much out there as you can for people to see something different? Is that? Well, we're always thinking about new stories to tell, and, and our constraints, because we, we, do, we are largely volunteer-oriented, mm -hmm. We have a limited capacity from from our, our great uh, exhibit people to, to to tell stories. So so we're focused on three or four stories now, but but you have to collect stuff today for an, uh, a curator to be able to tell a story fifty or hundred years from now. Mm -hmm. So the curator a hundred years from now can't go and say I want something from the original through hiker because if you haven't collected that now. It, it, it gets thrown out. So, so you have to try and anticipate what people will want in the future as, as well as what you want for your exhibits now. And, and you never know what somebody will want in the future. You know, stuff that's completely common now um, could all be, be lost. And everybody has one, but maybe not in the future. So a classic right. example of that, we have an exhibit from the class of 1983, and we were looking for a Svea 123 stove. And in the early 80s, you know, probably 80% of the stoves on the trail were Svea 123s or, or an analog of that. Um, and we had the hardest time finding a Svea 123 <laughs> stove because it didn't seem like a precious artifact to people. Then, and, you know, they'd move on to, to a lighter stove or something mm -hmm. and throw out the old stove. So it's, it's a classic example of something that, that's super common and, and so common nobody thinks to save it. So, so we have to think about things like that. Um, oh, one, one of the most unusual things that's been in storage we're, we're going to put in an exhibit now. Um, th through hikers always come up with these fascinating projects and they, they tend to be very goal oriented. And, and obsessive. So one through hiker, Gary Monk, um, in the early 2000s, hiked from Georgia to Maine and carried a hand counter, uh, wore it around his neck, and every time he saw a two by six inch white white blaze marking the trail, he clicked his counter, uh -huh. and he, he got to 80,900 blazes. Wow. So anyway, we're finally gonna put that counter on exhibit and and have a picture of Gary and tell his oh, story this cool. year. That seems like a lot of pressure to try to gather as much as you can now to I mean because you don't know what's going to be history it's almost it, it it is pressure and so so you you know that conflict I was talking about earlier um, stuff can seem very precious to the to the person who who did the trail the family member, you know, it's just junk clogging up the house. They want to throw it out. Right. And, you know, some family members, you know, they, they appreciate their, you know, what, what that person did. 
but but many others it's just junk it's it's a rusty old stove that doesn't work anymore um, my my shoes my ten hasn't been stored well you know the fabric is all gathered together uh, and and uh, I'm sure my wife would be happy to toss it <laughs> so do you still have all of your your original stuff I I have most of my original stuff one time when I was giving a book talk I had one of my two pairs of boots from my 1980 through hike and I, as I gathered up things in the bookstore I think I left one boot behind so so most of my stuff um, I still have oh here's a classic example so so Myron Avery Myron Avery and Benton Mackay are the two people who were credited with, with coming up with um, the idea of the Appalachian Trail and putting uh, putting uh, the trail on the ground Myron Avery tragically died early in life he was 52 years old died in the early 1950s and his his family um, one one son lived in Maine but the the other son moved out west and and they were pretty far removed from the AT after 19 1951-52 and they they knew Myron had had made an instrumental role in building the trail but th they didn't realize you know how many people were hiking the trail how much credit Myron Avery was given for building the trail and and they also didn't realize that the AT has been consciously emulated around the world so there's a 1700 mile trail in New Zealand New Zealand that was copied uh, on the AT there there's a couple of trails in parallel in, in Nepal the part of the Great Himalaya Trail and the director of that has come to Appalachian Trail events to study the AT. Uh, people have gone to Lebanon, war-torn Lebanon, to to copy the the Appalachian Trail and the Lebanon Mountain Trail. So the AT has been copied around the world. And when they developed the AT, there were no guidebooks, there were no shelters. People didn't really know how to um, do a long-distance trail. So Myron Avery had to develop a lot of the traditions and things. To support hikers so anyway he's he's had a, an impact on people around the world and his family had no appreciation for that and one of my colleagues here at the museum and I visited with the the, the family over the last 10 or 12 years and and gave the family a new appreciation for for how much Myron Avery had meant to to the Appalachian Trail community and, and still does yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, the family has given us an, a number of things um, for our collection, you know, as they realize how important Myron Avery is to us. So we have a folding kayak um, mounted uh, from the, the roof in the library, you know, that he used to scout some of the, the trail in Maine. Um, they, we, we have a measuring wheel that was donated by another, another um, ATC volunteer in Tennessee, Myron Avery had used this bicycle wheel to measure the AT and he's considered the pers first person to have walked the whole trail. Mm -hmm. He did it in day hikes and section hikes, um, not as a through hiker, but by 1936, even before the whole AT was was a continuous trail, he'd walked all of, of the trail, you know, and, and various other artifacts of Myron Avery. So, so by educating the family and, and uh, searching out, we've, we've gotten a lot of these precious artifacts that, that wouldn't have been, been uh, available otherwise, you know, if we hadn't, you know, educated people about how important these artifacts were. Mm -hmm. okay. That's amazing because I, that was the first thing when I saw uh, your sky parlor right now. That's yeah. all I could think of. I was like, wow. I mean, it. Uh, so grateful that someone envisioned it yes mm -hmm. and, and then it came to fruition right yeah. yeah oh so so the story of the sky parlor that this was Bent Mackay's office in Shirley Center Massachusetts this was his retreat his whole life and and starting as a, a boy um, Benton had explored the outdoors and he as a 14 year old he recorded these these various adventures in in Massachusetts it ended up uh, he, he um, published this in, in a book Expedition 9 about his early expeditions but he'd been fascinated by maps and exploring uh, the outdoors so 
anyway, he had the, this office, and, and after he died at, at age 97 in, in 1975, um, people at the Appalachian Trail Conservancy had, had gone and saved as, as, as much of the stuff as they could from Ben Mackay's sky parlor. But they, they'd had it in, in storage, and at, at one point his, his desk was was in a kind of a, a storage room off of their their main information center bookstore and actually what when when i i went to do research on my book in 1993 i sat at bent mckay's desk and moved the boxes out of the way and on the the, the walls there was a bookshelf with with some of his books and one, one of the things that inspired me to um, work on the museum was I saw his personal copy of the New York Walkbook, which which in New York is is the Bible for hiking trails. Mm -hmm. So so this was an original edition of the New York Walkbook from the early 1920s, and it had Ben Mackay's underlines and, and markings in the book, just on an open shelf. Wow! And, and it just um, that was enough for you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it just it just drove me crazy that this stuff wasn't being treasured and, and preserved. So, so anyway, the, the Bent Mackay stuff was in storage, but n no, nobody could see it except the ATC employees and nobody, it wasn't really treasured. So when we had the opportunity to, to bring that stuff here, they, they wanted to get rid of it. So we made it one of our, well, they were turning, they've, they've turned over their archives to George Mason University oh, okay. and, and the stuff is well preserved and, and professional there. But, but at that time, they thought that would be a great addition to the museum. So, so we've made that in, into an exhibit and the, the exhibit designer positioned things so papers are on the desk and it looks lived in. It looks yes. like Benton Mackay just stepped out to go to lunch or take a nap yep. or something. Yep. And, and you can just visualize Benton Mackay, this great thinker and innovative person you know, coming up with the idea for the Appalachian Trail in this room. And how much thought process went into that. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's very yeah. amazing. So we've had his his typewriter on an exhibit since our very first exhibit. We opened the museum in 2010, but we did our very first exhibit. Uh, we opened on National Trails Day in 2007 at ATC headquarters, and we had his typewriter on exhibit from the very beginning and continue to have it on exhibit. You touched on lightly here and there about the volunteers and I you said something in regards to most people like to hear the stories of the hikers and that not so much about the volunteers out on the trail painting the blazes and that sort of thing however I think um, the stories of the volunteers are fantastic just from what I'm learning from the volunteers now most of them that are here at the Appalachian Trail Museum have hiked the AT, and they all have a story, right? Uh, everybody who's hiked the AT has a story, and not all of our volunteers have hiked the old AT. I would say maybe a third to a half of our volunteers have hiked the whole AT, or they're piecing the trail together, or they're really into hiking. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of volunteers who, who really haven't hiked. But, but they love this project and, and they love being part of this community and they love coming here. You know, when you're a volunteer greeter at the museum, you're, you're coming across people from all over the world and our visitors have great stories. Mm -hmm. So we, we haven't kept up with this tally, but the first year we were open, we had visitors from 47 states and 20 foreign countries. So, so by now we've had visitors from every state and dozens and dozens of, of foreign countries. So you're always meeting fascinating people. And often the people behind uh, the, the desk are fascinating people. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, so today, uh, Bruce Dun Dunlavy and his uh, companion Susan are, are, are volunteers. And Bruce has done the whole AT. He's done the Pacific Crest Trail. He's done backpacking and, and hiking 
you know, many places around the, the country. He knew Earl Schaefer well from living in the, this area and has been instrumental in preserving Earl Schaefer's legacy. And, and Bruce is also a, a skilled carpenter and, and construction person and he's done work on the museum, he's done work on the hostel, he's done beautiful cab work on, on the cabins in, in this area. So, so one of the, the fascinating stories uh, connected to Bruce, um, on, on exhibit now we, we have the plaque, the original plaque from Center Point Knob, not too far from here. So in the 1930s, Center Point was the actual geographic center of the Appalachian mm -hmm. Trail. And as the trail's been relocated over the years, the, the actual geographic center point moves just about every year. And, and the general trend since the 30s has been to move south. So it's probably <coughs> 20 or 30 miles south of where it was in 1930. Mm -hmm. But in the late 1930s, the Mountain Club of Maryland um, placed a, a, a two pound metal plaque on, on center point knob that said, this is the center point of the Appalachian Trail. And, and at some point in the 1940s, it disappeared. And, you know, there was, you could see on the boulder, the, the impression where that plaque had been, mm -hmm. but, but the plaque disappeared for, for decades and decades. And Bruce was doing work on, on a farmer's cabin a few miles from Center Point Knob and saw this plaque on the mantle of, mm -hmm. of, of that farmhouse. And the farmer said he'd been um, digging for fence posts and came across uh, a hard object and, and unearthed this plaque on, on his farm and didn't know what it was, so just put it up on the mantle. And Bruce instantly had recognized that. Mm -hmm. and. The, the, the day we opened, June 5th, um, 2010, a couple hours before we opened, Bruce came to me and he said, I have a surprise from you. And from where we're sitting, he walked me back up, up the road a little bit and, and showed me this plaque. <laughs> wow. wow. So, Pretty cool. So, so that, was, that was quite something to have added to our collection the, the, the day of our grand opening. This is um, the original uh, plaque that was placed at Center Point Knob, which was at one time lost and found. So that's just one of our many fascinating volunteers. Exactly, and that was my point. I think the volunteers have such fascinating stories. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and they're so talented, you know, people with master's degrees, PhDs, all kinds of, of, of skills. Um, and, and it's just tremen tremendous, the, the dedication and creativity. You know, they're always thinking of new ideas, ways to do things better. Um, stuff we should do and, and pretty much the um mm -hmm. keeping everything going yeah, yeah. and even the yeah. museum is a community project so yeah. again it's back to that community i mean that's 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 fantastic and i'm mm -hmm. sure that that keeps people driven that's just great so so it's very much a community and in inside the the door on on our our floor right outside the ben mckay exhibit there's a plaque we've had uh, on on the, that door jam since the very beginning, and it lists about 50 people, 50 volunteers, who who worked, you know, over the couple of months in in the spring of 2010 mm -hmm. to to get the museum going. So that list is just the people who worked on the inside. Yeah. We had another 30 or 40 who who worked on the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, getting the museum grounds together. We had a volunteer gardener, Georgia Free. So we, we opened on, on Saturday, June 5th. On Thursday afternoon, June 3rd, Georgia Free came here with a van loaded with flowers. Nobody had told her to do this. Nobody knew she was doing it. Um, she, she had a van full of flowers, put it on the walkway outside the museum, did, did a beautiful job. So people who came on Saturday, they would have thought we had a flower garden for <laughs> years. Yeah. <coughs> so, so yeah, to highlight the, the point about the volunteers, I'll, I'll mention a few other things just with, with 
with that week getting ready to to dedicate the museum so on on saturday june 5th we ended up with 750 people for our grand opening we had a big tent here in the field mm -hmm. On Wednesday morning, we had no exhibits other than the Earl Schaefer mm -hmm. shelter, and our, our exhibit fabricators came that day and started installing things. But we had buckets and nails, we had stuff all over the museum. And today, outside the museum, we have the original halfway marker. It was uh, an elaborate, almost totem pole that had been up on Pole Steeple Mountain, uh, just north of the museum, for 25 years. And and when the, the, the center point of the trail had shifted south. Um, uh, eventually, the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club decided that that should come down. And, and I, I started hearing reports that somebody had stolen the, the, the halfway marker. And I went finally to a, a meeting of, of the local chapter, the Yankee Clippers of the uh, Potomac Appalachian Trail Club, mm -hmm. and one of the guys said, you know, we have the halfway marker for, for you. We were saving it for you. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so other people had noticed it was gone, but they didn't know what was going on. So anyway, we, we had this big thing. Um, we put it in the, the basement of the museum temporarily, and we were trying to decide what to do with it as we were getting the museum ready to open. And um, we were thinking, you know, it would be, we, at, when we opened the museum, we were, we were just on one floor. And we were thinking of leaning that against the fireplace, but to do that, we would have had to cut the bottom two feet off. Mm -hmm. And one of the people who was helping us was uh, Nami Basil, who was a triple, triple crowner. So had done each of wow. the three trails three times, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's almost 25,000 miles of backpacking, yeah. just that. So anyway, he said, you know, it's been outdoors for 25 years. We can probably just prop it up on the porch outdoors and it'll be okay. And it was all dirty and grimy and stuff. Mm -hmm. So he took a hose, he, he spent hours washing it, cleaning, we dried it out in the sun, and he propped it against the, that um, uh, porch fence. And it was there in time for the, the grand opening, and it's been there ever since. <laughs> and it is the symbol now of the museum. We're, we're, we're the halfway place. Right. Cool. So, so here's one of our talented volunteers doing like some creative work, but also some menial work. And later that day, he and another um, through hiker uh, Noel de Cavalcante, the, the singing horseman, got down on their hands and knees for hours and scrubbed and polished the floor so, so it looked shiny and was ready for the grand opening. Somebody else showed up with balloons. Uh, Noel had put together this, this green banner that said the Appalachian Trail Museum that we, we still have. And he'd come up with this, he had a pointy piece of wood and he'd just... Um, printed on their Apple a AT Museum and we thought that would last a day. We still have that, Aww. you know, and and so we had balloons, we had we had flowers, we had everything for the grand opening. <clears throat> Nobody coordinated this. Oh, <laughs> Nobody wow. knew any of this was happening. And you know, and when the perfectly. and when the seven hundred and some people crowded through the museum that day, it looked like they didn't know the difference. Did they, they didn't know the difference. <laughs> yeah. it, it looked great. It looked like it'd been planned. It looked like the the museum had had been, you know, there forever. Uh, we actually got our certificate of occupancy twenty five hours be before we had our grand opening ceremony. Uh, so you were chewing your nails a little bit on that, huh? <laughs> I, I was totally fried. <laughs> so, you know, if you look at pictures now, you can just see how tired I was. Yeah, and, I'm sure. and that day we had, you know, 750 people in a tent over here. Um, we had the, the, the Secretary of the Department of uh, Conservation and Natural Resources for Pennsylvania. We had the Chairman of, of the American Hiking Society. You know, uh, Grandma Gatewood's youngest daughter, Lucy Seeds, here, on and on and on. Yeah, and it had to have been a really cool event. It was, it was a great event, but if we hadn't gotten the C, C, Certificate of Occupancy, none of none them could of have seen wow. 
Well, and here's another story. My my wife Frida just walked by, and she's lived the, this museum her whole life. But oh, for 12 years, I was working on the museum before we opened. And and at some points, it must have just seemed to her like this was my imaginary friend, <laughs> you know. And I'd tell her I was going to a museum meeting, and you know she had to be a little skeptical. Okay, yeah. museum meeting, sure, <laughs> but but but, but but you know every once in a while, like twenty boxes would show up at our house, so she knew something was up. She knew Earl Schaefer's hatchet was in the bedroom closet. Um, but but anyway, um, that morning, the two of us came to the park early, and and I gave her a private showing in the museum. Uh, we walk in and she said, it's a museum. <laughs> and, and she was totally surprised, uh, you know, at, at the quality and that it was a, a real museum. That had to be an mm -hmm. awesome feeling. And you said it was going to be one and she was surprised <laughs> that you did it, right? <laughs> she, she couldn't believe it, yeah. You know, at the end of the day, that had to be just an amazing feeling for you all after you shut the doors and just, I mean, so much blood, sweat and tears, I'm sure, went into it. Well, well, the 50 volunteers, we, we had a professional house painter who moved into the museum for three weeks and, and did the painting. Wow. You know, we had a, a, a skilled contractor, a volunteer um, with the Potomac Appalachian uh, a Trail Conference. Al was just a, an amazing talent and just on and on. We, we had an 89-year-old guy putting sheetrock up. I mean, it's just... Uh, all amazing. these people it's, it's phenomenal it yeah really is. it's heartwarming it's it's and that's i think why we're so drawn to it right oh, there here, are just here's so many another stories. story about a skilled volunteer so at trail days you know 2008 we we still didn't have a lease we didn't have a building and this guy comes up to me at trail days and he says i'm i'm a plumber you know if you need any help um, I'd be happy to help. I live a mile from the, uh, an hour from the museum. I've done the AT two, two times. So I wrote on a little scrap of paper his contact information. <clears throat> two years later, I call him up mm -hmm. <laughs> and say, we're working on the museum. I need a plumber. He came here and did all our plumbing. That's awesome. awesome. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That is so awesome. Yeah. I bet you have a million stories like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, two more. <laughs> okay, we're all about it. So when you were getting ready to open the museum, so so this is um, no, November 2009. So we, we've gotten the lease signed in June 2009. You know, at that time we didn't have an architect, we didn't have any money, we didn't have any exhibits. And I said, we're going to open April 1st, 2010. And you know, my, my board said, you know, that's a little ambitious. So I said, okay, we'll open National Trails Day, June 5th, 2010. August, we get the, the, the architect as a volunteer. In July, we, we got a woman to volunteer as a graphic designer. Her, her specialty, uh, uh, Nancy's specialty was designing uh, flatware and, and dinnerware. Mm -hmm. Uh, and she came up with with the um, pattern for our exhibits and circulation mm -hmm. that we still use today. Um, in November, I, I get an email from uh, a public relations uh, professional, Joe Patterson. You know, I write back to him. You know, we don't have any budget for for PR, and he says I'm a volunteer. He turned out to be the most skilled. Uh, PR professional I was ever around mm -hmm. and the reason we had 750 people at our grand opening was mm -hmm. Joe and about the same time a, a woman approached me you know and she said you know I'm a through hiker and uh, you know I've worked with exhibits and stuff at the Museum of um, Modern yeah. Art in, in Manhattan you know one of the great museums in the world and I wrote back to her and I said you know we'd love to have you involved we don't have any budget and she said I'm a volunteer awesome <laughs> So he did our publicity. She she did our exhibits. Uh, just uh, amazing volunteers, and we were able to open up with with a museum of National Park Service or even Smithsonian quality because of these great volunteers. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up because the stories I hear and the people that I meet, it's just phenomenal to me. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. An, an unbelievably talented group of people. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it brings up the best in people. So. Yeah, yeah, the AT in general, 
people, you know, that they, they enjoy the trail, they enjoy helping out each other, and the people in the trail communities enjoy helping out the hikers and, you know, doing the trail work. I, you know, it has to be probably the biggest, most complicated project in, in the country that's primarily the work of volunteers. Yes, it is. You're right. All right. So we just want to say thank you. I mean, we know that you could probably sit here all day and we could yeah. too. And we could too, yeah. And but. we hope to do it again with you, uh, do it again sometime down the road with you. But uh, yes, we, uh, we very wanted to say thank you for coming out and meeting with us today, sharing all your fabulous stories. Um, well, well, thanks for listening and thanks for bringing your professionalism to the museum. <laughs> well, we have one small request from you. Okay. We just want you to sign our book. Yes, please. <laughs> All right, so we just were the lucky two people that had our book signed, and we're thrilled about, about that. Um, anyhow, we hope that all of you enjoyed listening and learning something from this gentleman. He is like a wealth and a well of knowledge in regards to the Appalachian Trail and the history and artifacts behind it. And just want to say thank you, Larry, for everything that you've done. It's fantastic. Well, well, thanks uh, mm -hmm. for, for what you're doing and, and for listening. Oh, oh <laughs> we could listen to you for hours. <laughs> and you guys may in the future get to hear a little bit more. So anyhow, thanks, Larry, and thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. So this is the only place that you are going to find on the entire Appalachian Trail that they actually encourage you to feed the wildlife. This is the donation box outside of the AT Museum and we encourage you to feed the bear. <laughs>